Alright, hey guys, welcome back, and want to continue our study of Matthew today. We covered Matthew chapter 1 yesterday, uh, didn't get to chapter 2. So today we're going to start in Matthew chapter 2, and possibly also do chapter 3. So we continue to look at Matthew's gospel, and what he records about the life and work of Jesus, and showing and proving Jesus of Nazareth to be the Son of God, the Messiah, the Chosen One, the King of Israel who was to come and to bring salvation for the people of Israel. And so that is what we have been looking at in Matthew. And remember one of the key parts of that was uh, the prophecies made about the Messiah and the Christ. And that's the one thing that Matthew really does stress in his gospel or that he reveals to us is he shows how Jesus of Nazareth has fulfilled all of those prophecies, the many prophecies uh, that were made about the Messiah. Jesus fulfilled them and add that with the miracles he's going to do, the things he's going to teach. Um, and it's just you cannot miss the, the fact that Jesus of Nazareth truly is the Messiah, the Christ, our King. And so we're going to look at that as we continue to study through Matthew. I'm glad you've joined. Um, again, you can follow along in your Bible, or if you want to just follow along and listen, uh, we'll read through it, and we'll um, try to make some points as we go along. And if you ever have any comments or questions, uh, please comment on these videos, and I will get back to you. And I uh, would always love discussion or answer any questions, whatever can be helpful for you and for me. As we continue to grow in God's Word and to grow in faith and in our hope and in our love. And so that's what we want to keep working on while we spend the time we do in God's Word. And that's my goal from spending time in the Gospel written by Matthew. And so chapter 1, if you remember, and I started out with the genealogy of Jesus. Excuse me. And again, the, the why that is important... Um, especially for the Jews, is they were very big on genealogy. And what we need to understand most about the genealogy is that Jesus, as Matthew shows, was a descendant of Abraham and of David and has fulfilled the promise of God both to Abraham and to David. Um, and so that is what we really need to remember by the genealogy. I didn't spend a lot of time on the genealogy um, you know, somebody recently asked me um, about genealogies. Is it, is it important for us, you know, to, do we need to memorize them? Do we have to memorize these genealogies? And my answer is no. Um, now, don't get me wrong. These genealogies are very important. Uh, but thankfully, we have them recorded in a book in the Bible. Um, so really, you know, I don't think it's important for us to have these memorized because what we can do is we can always, if we're needing to learn something about it or to check it, we can always go back to God's Word, to the Bible, and we can uh, look it up. We can look at it. Um, and I don't even know if I can remember all these names um, and all of that, but, the, but what we do need to remember and memorize from these genealogies is ultimately that Jesus descended from Abraham, from David, and that is the key thing to memorize. And as long, I think, as long as we have that understood, um, then the genealogies has have served us well enough. Um, so certainly, we could do some more in-depth studies in the genealogies, and some have, and some do, and that's great. Um, we can use their resources, but just for all of us on a daily basis, uh, we need to really get the the main message and point of these genealogies. And that is to show the lineage of Jesus and that he is the descended Christ, son of God. Um, he is our high priest. He is king. Um, and that's what we get from those genealogies. And then at the end of chapter 1, we looked at the birth of Jesus. Um, that Joseph and Mary were betrothed to be married. Um, but Mary was found to be with child. Uh, Joseph thought she was unfaithful, and so Joseph was going to put her away privately, not wanting to bring shame. Um, but before he could do that, an angel came to Joseph in the dream and told him to not be afraid to take her as his wife uh, because the child conceived in her was done by the Holy Spirit, by the power of God, a miraculous conception, even though she was a virgin. And then he was to call his name Jesus, because as the angel said, he will save his people from their sins. And then 
Uh, all this took place to fulfill the prophecy about the virgin birth from Isaiah. And so Joseph did exactly what the, uh, what he was commanded by the Lord through the angel to do. And so he did not know Mary uh, sexually until after Jesus was born. And when Jesus was born, they named him Jesus, just as he was commanded to do. And so we see the faith of Joseph played out in this. Uh, of course, the other Gospels, like uh, Luke, also show you know the faith of Mary. Um, but we'll maybe talk about that in another time when maybe we study the book of Luke together. But right now, I want to focus on what Matthew is giving us, what he is revealing to us, and that's what we have so far. So then in chapter 2, um, we're not told how many days pass, uh, but it opens up in verse 1, that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king. So we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, um, but this is now in chapter 2, this is after he has been born, and it seems to be, um, as we're going to find out later in this chapter, um, that it could have been within anywhere of two years um, because of Herod's decision later on about the, the male children who were two years and under. Uh, so this is not right after the birth of Jesus. Um, that some time has passed, uh, they are no longer in the manger, um, they're no longer in, rather, the, you know, the barn, um, and so they are going to be found to be in a home, um, Jesus has grown, you know, he's a child, however young, but under the age of two, possibly, um, so we're told that after he's born, in these days, in the days of Herod the king, that wise men, magi, come, uh, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, and they show up to Jerusalem, and here's what they're looking for. They ask, in verse 2, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star as it ro or when it rose, and we have come to worship him. So these wise men, we're told, these magi show up in Jerusalem, and they're looking for the one who has now been born king of the the Jews. They're looking for him, and they mention, you know, the, uh, this star, that a star has risen, and they have followed the star. They, it is a sign for them. Now, we're not told anything about that, as far as I know. Um, you know, God must have worked in them, revealed things to them, for them to understand about this star and about Jesus' birth and come looking for him. All we are told is they do come looking for him, and they say, we're looking for the one who was born king of the Jews because we have come to worship him. Well, imagine Herod's response, and even the people, uh, that these guys show up in Jerusalem and they start talking about some new king, uh, uh, an heir, supposedly of some kind, one who has been born king of the Jews. Well, obviously, Herod's going to be riled up by that. Uh, he's not going to like the sound of that, of maybe somebody who's coming to take his place. The people aren't really fond of that idea either. Um, but you would think, and this, this part always confuses me, because you know the Jews have for so long been waiting for the Messiah, been waiting for the Christ, been waiting for the King of the Jews, and finally some guys show up and they say, hey, the King of the Jews has been born. Uh, we're even going to find that they, they look up Scripture because, well, let's just continue. Um, in verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem was troubled with him. I mean, they hear about the king of the Jews, and now they're all troubled and upset and worried. Why? Because look at what even they ask. They ask, or, or what Herod does in verse 3, or in verse 4, rather, when they were troubled, he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people who knew the law of God, who knew the word of God, who knew these prophecies. And he inquired of them, notice, where the Christ was to be born. Specifically, wanted to know where the Christ was going to be born. You would think, great, that's what they needed to be thinking and searching and looking for, because that's what they were waiting for. And they even know, they understand the scriptures. They tell him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and this is probably a reference to uh, what is said in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, 
For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So they knew the references. They knew the prophecies. They knew where the Christ was to be born and where he was going to be coming from. And you would think, great, this is exciting. They're they're right on it. They know the truth. They know what they're looking for. But notice what Herod then does in verse 7. Herod summoned those wi- or the wise men who had came to Jerusalem, but he summons them secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. So he wanted to know, okay, when did the star appear? Let's do some calculations. And then he sent, he sends the wise man to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. What child? Again, the one they're saying who has been born king of the Jews, and according to Herod, is the Christ. Herod says, yes, go find the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I too may come and worship him. And so Herod seems that he has sincere intentions and wants to know know, the Christ, the one who has been born king of the Jews, and wants to worship him as well. But if you remember how this goes, we're going to find out that he wasn't so sincere um, and he had evil intentions. We'll we'll get to that in just a moment. In verse 9 then, after listening to the king, the wise men went on their way. And behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Again, being led by the star. Um, obviously a miraculous doing, leading, guiding by God. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they go into the house and they see the child with Mary, his mother, and they fall down and worship him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frank- frankincense and myrrh. And and being warned then in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And so the wise men are led to Jesus, who is now a child. Um, And they find the house where they are living and they go in and they see the child and they're so excited and they're rejoicing and they they worship and praise and they're, they're so thrilled that they have found the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen one, the king who has come to save Israel, and they offer gifts. You know, those gifts included gold and frankincense and myrrh. And notice, here's a little fact tip, fact tip. Um, You notice we're not told how many wise men there were. You know, there's always pictured, um, you know, by society, oh, there were three wise men. Well, how do you know that? You know, it doesn't tell us anywhere that I remember uh, that there were three wise men. Um, and anyways, that's kind of a side note, uh, that's a point, but notice again also, this time, the time when, uh, the wise men came to see Jesus was not when he was in, you know, had just been born and was laid in a manger, but rather this is, you know, a year or so, whatever in that time frame later, after Jesus' birth, that they come to him in a house, in his home, when he is a little infant or toddler, child, whatever you want to call him. And um, so it was not the same time. The ones who went to see Jesus when he was born, after, right after he was born, were the shepherds. The shepherds did go see Jesus when he was born. And that's what Luke tells us. But here Matthew tells us about the time later when the wise men came to see Jesus at his home. So they're rejoicing, they give gifts, they worship Jesus. I mean, he's just a little child infant. Imagine, (laughs) you know, what's going through Mary and Joseph's mind um, with this. And, you know, what they're thinking, seeing these men show up, and they're just rejoicing, and they're worshiping their son, and they're giving all these beautiful gifts. I mean, it must have really just perplexed them. I can't talk today. Uh, Really stunned them amazed them to wonder what was going on. But then, as we're told in verse 12, as we read, that in a dream, that being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So God tells those wise men, do not go back to Herod. 
because God knows what Herod's real intentions are, as we're about to find out, starting in, um, oh, as we'll get to verse 16. But before that, so God sends the wise men safely on their way, not to go to Herod. And then, verse 13 of Matthew chapter 2, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord then comes to Joseph in a dream and tells him to get up, take the child and his mother, and flee away. Flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child, not to worship him, not to give him gifts, not to praise him, but instead to destroy him. So Herod, the little lying joker he was, didn't really want to uh, worship Jesus, worship the Messiah, worship the Christ. He wanted to try to destroy him. That shows the depravity of man. That shows the, how hatred and jealousy, envy, selfishness works. That it even blinded him as in as Jerusalem as well. Instead of accepting who the Christ was, they, they wanted to just get rid of him and continue their own life the way they were going. But God warns Joseph, tells him to flee, run away to Egypt. And so Joseph, verse 14, got up and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill, notice end of verse 15, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. That's prophecy number three, if you've been keeping track. Remember, prophecy number two um, was back um, talking about Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. And now we have the third prophecy Matthew records being fulfilled, that out of Egypt I called my son. And so Joseph gets up, takes Mary, takes Jesus, runs away to Egypt, and they live there until after Herod has died and is gone. But in the meantime, while they have run away, while they're in Egypt, Verse 16, Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious. And he sent, notice what he does. He sends and kills all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. What a wicked, horrible thought. Which is really nothing new in our world. The other time instance, another time we're told about this kind of slaughter happened was back in Exodus when the children of Israel were in Egypt and Pharaoh was getting rid of the male children of Egypt when they were born. Herod is doing that here. You know, we have abortion today. You know, abortion is nothing new. Now, maybe the means and reason, reasoning has changed. But abortion is no different than what Herod is doing here, what Pharaoh did in Egypt. It's the slaughter of innocent children. And how horrible and wicked that is. Which then we're told this actually fulfills a prophecy and not a good one. That it was prophesied, as Matthew goes on to say, that then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. That's prophecy number four. A sad one, a one of mourning and sorrow and lamentation being fulfilled by this slaughter by Herod. I just can't even imagine these innocent people in Bethlehem and in that region. I don't know who was sent to kill them. If it was guards, maybe probably soldiers. But imagine having these men show up to your home and uh, they're searching for any male children. I have four children. 
And I've watched them all be born. Watched them grow up. And I can't imagine having someone show up to my home looking for any child, male child of mine, any of my sons. And if they happen to be two years old or younger, then they were taken and killed. Imagine the sorrow. Imagine the pain of all those families, of all those homes. We're not even told how many. From the sound of it, from the looks of it, I guess, it was probably a considerable amount. One is too many. But I think we really need to spend time thinking about and really feeling the things that went on and the things that happened. Imagine even what Joseph and Mary must have been thinking, being uprooted from their home, having to leave because someone, because the government was going to come and kill their child by Herod's doing. It's just unbelievable. I can't even imagine the pain and sorrow. No wonder it's a fulfillment of the prophecy of the crying, of the weeping, the lamentation, the not wanting to be comforted. It would be so hard to endure. But that is the wickedness of man, wickedness of sin, of hatred and jealousy. But that's what happened and what Herod tried to do. Well, continuing then in verse 19, when Herod does finally die, behold, an angel does come, uh, an angel of the Lord does come to Joseph again in a dream at that time while Joseph and his family were in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Herod's gone. Finally, um, you know, you know, Herod's not there to keep looking for the child or to worry about the child. So the angel tells Joseph it's time to head back to Israel. And so Joseph gets up, takes the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus, if that's how you say it, was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, well, Joseph was afraid to go there. Eh, don't blame him. Um, you know, like father, like son, possibly. And he was actually warned in a dream by God. Uh, being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. So instead of Bethlehem, um, instead of that part, he goes to a district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. That was spoken, or that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. Here's another prophecy, and why they ended up going and living in Nazareth. Here is prophecy number five. We're only in Matthew chapter two, mind you. We're only in Matthew chapter two, and already Matthew has shown us in the birth and childhood of Jesus, that Jesus possibly under two years old, already five prophecies are now being fulfilled, have been fulfilled. And that's what he tells us here. That he, the prophecy being fulfilled was, he shall be called a Nazarene. He shall be called a Nazarene. And that's why Jesus ended up living in Nazareth. The amazing power and plan and will of God fulfilling these prophecies Again, the reason these prophecies are so important is because they were meant to prepare the people, but not only prepare them, but to see that when these prophecies are fulfilled by one man, then you can know without a shadow of a doubt that this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. This is the King of Israel to be born, to come. This is the Savior. And that is why Matthew is pointing these out to us to say, look, here's the proof, here's the evidence. Everything about Jesus and his life on this earth fulfills all the prophecies made about the Christ and Messiah, chosen one of God. So how could we ignore that? How could we reject it? That's what Herod did, even. 
Herod didn't pay attention. He even knew the prophecy of Jesus' birth, of where the Christ was to be born. But he looked past it because he was only interested in what he wanted not what God wanted. So you and I cannot ignore this proof and evidence either of Jesus, our Christ, our Messiah. If we want proof, if we want to know that this Jesus of Nazareth is truly the Christ, the Messiah, that's why we have the Gospels that show us the prophecies being fulfilled, that is going to show us the the miracles and power he, he performed on earth, the teaching he gave, his Death and his resurrection and ascension into heaven, which we've not gotten to the rest of that yet. But that's what's to come, and that's what we can look forward to. Well, I'm actually going to go go ahead and stop there today. And I appreciate you if you join with me. I'm glad you have. Um, I'm glad you spent this time with me today. I hope it's been helpful, encouraging, and uplifting as we look back and read about our Savior our King, our Messiah, the one who who came to save us, the one who we believe in and have faith in. And I hope that this will cause us to continue to learn and grow in faith and in our hope and in our love for God and in our love for one another. May God bless you this day. Use it to the glory of God. Make your life all about God, living for Him, living for Jesus. May God bless you. I love you all. Take care.